rapture all you are No lofty thought, no scholar of this world Could grasp an inch of such infinity Though we cannot comprehend such a mystery just a glimpse of you revealed is compelling us to sing. Holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, worthy, worthy is your name. All of heaven joins the universe. Amazed in songs that never frame the fullness of your worth and majesty. We come again and fall on bended knee and hear a door God that we don't see. Though we cannot comprehend a mystery just a glimpse of you revealed is compelling us to sing holy holy is the lord god almighty worthy worthy is your name all of heaven joins the universe ever crying worthy worthy is your name holy holy is the lord god almighty worthy worthy is your name all of heaven joins the universe ever crying worthy worthy is your name when you return hear the trumpet sound you will lead us home riding on the clouds where we will stand and sing forevermore the honor and the praise the glory is the Lord's holy holy is the Lord Worthy, worthy is your name. All of heaven joins the universe ever crying. Worthy, worthy is your name. Worthy, worthy is your brothers and sisters. Uh, today we are going to be continuing in our study of Chronicles, so if you want to start turning, we're going to be in 2 Chronicles 10, 1 through 19. We're going to be looking at Rehoboam. He's kind of considered a, a bad 
king. He is the fourth king of Israel, third of the line of David and the son of Solomon. So if you're turning there, Second Chronicles 10 again. Uh, but before, before I actually talk about that, I kind of want to talk about kind of this, I feel like it's a shared human experience of receiving bad advice. I think, I think if you haven't received bad advice somewhere in your life, you're, you're counted lucky because this is kind of just something that you get. You get bad advice. You give bad advice as well. And Jimmy Fallon also has talked about bad advice. He's, he's the talk show host of The Late Show. And a while ago, I think it was three or four years ago, he put out on Twitter uh, uh, a, a request for people to send in their bad advice that they have been given or that they have given and he started off, he, he actually gave his own bad advice on Twitter. And he said, I used horse shampoo because I was told it would make my hair shinier. But it turns out it's just for horses. And then he added that hashtag bad advice. Okay. Now, a lot of other people joined in on Twitter and they decided to also share some of the advice that they had given with that hashtag bad advice on with it. So Tim Drake, he said, my dad told me the escalator was voice activated. So I spent 10 minutes yelling, go up, before he told me it was broken. Hashtag bad advice. And I feel like that's something my dad would do to me, so that really, that one was personal. Uh, Lucas said, my first time eating sushi, my friend told me the green stuff was like butter. So he said, smear as much of that on your sushi as you can. Hashtag bad advice. I gave a stranger super specific instructions on how to get somewhere that they asked me about, only to realize after they left, I was thinking of a different place. Hashtag bad advice. I told my little brother he was supposed to eat the peel instead of the actual banana, and he did that for two weeks straight. Hashtag bad advice. I really like this one. I was told that if I were to smell the lines at the bottom of a swimming pool, it would smell like cherries. Turns out it just hurts really bad. I had a disposable camera once when I got to the end of the film. I asked my friend what I was supposed to do with it, and he said, it's disposable. Just throw it away. I put bacon on a pimple because my grandma told me it would make it go away, and it grew. Hashtag bad advice. And the last one, after spinning and getting really dizzy, my older brother told me to spin in the other direction to cancel it out. Hashtag bad advice, hashtag hurl. And while these, these are funny, I, I think that there's some truth to this as well. We often hear bad advice, and a lot of the times we can discern whether it's good or bad, but sometimes it's presented in a way where it seems like it might be good advice that we should follow. I can think of several off the top of my head. One one example of this would be, and I, I used to hear it a lot more than I hear it now, but sticks and stones may break my bones, and you guys know the end, but words will never hurt me. This is, this is terrible advice. Words have a huge effect on people, and, and to dismiss it so, so easily is, is very dangerous. It does two things. One, it makes those who feel like they've been hurt by words, it makes them feel potentially isolated because words aren't supposed to hurt and it gives those who say the mean words the freedom to continue saying these mean words because there's no weight behind what they're saying. So this is a very dangerous saying. Or, or this other one, it's a very Disney saying. I think I, I haven't seen a single Disney movie where this isn't in it somewhere, this concept, or on a t-shirt or wherever. But this idea that we should follow our heart, right? We hear this all the time in Disney princess movies and all the time that I spend watching Disney princess movies. I don't think that theme is not shown up. But the Bible tells us that the heart is, is desperately wicked, that it wants only for itself, and that without correction from God, without God making a change in our lives, we cannot listen to our hearts. Or this last one, try it and you'll like it. Right? I've heard this before. And the problem with that one is that usually it's true. If you try it, you probably will end up liking it, but usually those things that you have to be persuaded into trying in order to like it are things that you don't want to end up liking, and this can lead to all kinds of um, addictions or other problems. The things in and of themselves aren't always the problem, but the lifestyle change that it creates is. I mean, this isn't just specific to alcohol or smoking or any of these things, but it can also be watching too much TV. Oh, you should try this show. You're really going to like it. And then we sit down and we watch Netflix all day. We watch an entire show in one sitting, right? 
try it and you'll like it is one of the worst. I, I, th I think there's a the flip side of this of, well, it's an acquired taste. You just have to grow to like it. And I mean, I've heard this with all kinds of things, but the one I hear it with the most is coffee, right? I sh I'm sure most of us in here drink coffee. I do not drink coffee. I was told, try it and you'll like it. If you don't like it, it's an acquired taste. You just have to keep on trying it until you get to a point where you enjoy drinking it. You'll, you'll need it. And I think that there are people who are addicted to coffee as well, and that's a different thing, but I'm, I'm not a fan of the idea of bullying myself into liking something. I've never been a fan of that. There's actually, we have a term for when you, you don't like something and overexposure to it makes you end up liking it. That's Stockholm Syndrome, um, and I have no interest into being Stockholm Syndrome and liking coffee, so I, I'm fine running off of my own energy. But as we get into the text, we're going to read about Rehoboam, like I said, the fourth king of Israel. He's generally considered a bad king, and I'm, I'm going to kind of read through this and break it down. There's a lot of historical context that you don't really understand without the proper uh, perspective, so I'm going to kind of read it, not quite verse by verse, but I'll read through, I'll exposit, provide context, and we'll kind of get to the end of this, and we'll, we'll go through application. But here in verse 1 of chapter 10, it says, Rehoboam went to Shechem, for all Israel had come to Shechem to make him king. And that's where I'm going to take my first break. Because there's so much significance going on right here that we, we often don't understand. So many of us have probably heard of Shechem. If we've read the Bible, it's very relevant. But I'm sure most of us are kind of like, mm, I don't really know anything that actually happened there. Some of us might. But aside from the fact that Rehoboam was made king there, which we just read, we probably don't know a lot about what's going on there. But an Old Testament reader someone reading this with the proper context and the proper mindset and understanding would immediately recognize Shechem as a very historically significant location. Shechem is where Abraham, right? We remember Abraham, Father Abraham had many sons, but this is where Abraham was promised that he would have those many sons. This is where the covenant with Abraham was made that he would be given land and seed and blessing if he was to follow God. And so we have this this location that is super significant to Israel as a whole. But also, and there's a lot of stuff that happened at Shechem, but these are, these are the two main things I want to focus on. The other thing that happened at Shechem is that this is where Joshua, when entering the promised land, right? Because Moses wasn't allowed to enter the promised land, so Joshua brought them in. When Joshua entered the promised land, this is where he said that very familiar line, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Shechem is where that happened, and, and he didn't just say this, he made a visual representation of this. He took a stone, a big stone, and he placed it at Shechem so that it would act as a visual reminder that his people will follow the wisdom and guidance of God. So here's Rehoboam, right? He's being crowned king at Shechem in the presence of this visual reminder to follow the wisdom of God. All right, so verse 2, now that we're out of verse 1, we'll keep going. Verse 2 says... And as soon as Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, heard of it, for he was in Egypt where he had fled from King Solomon, then Jeroboam returned from Egypt. So Jeroboam runs away because Solomon doesn't really want him there anymore. Solomon dies, and Jeroboam comes back. He's like, okay, this guy who, who doesn't want me here, he's gone, I'm going to come back. And this is written here as a way to kind of foreshadow that there is trouble that is going to come. It's not a good thing that he is coming back. This is a bad omen. Verse 3, okay? And we'll get through more than one verse this time. We'll, we'll chug a little bit faster. It says, And they sent and called him, and they, which is Israel, sent and called him, Jeroboam, and Jeroboam and all Israel came and said to Rehoboam, Your father made our yoke heavy, now therefore lighten the hard service of your father and his heavy yoke on us, and we will serve you. He said to them, come to me again in three days. So the people went away. Okay, so Jeroboam comes back and Israel says, hey, this guy that ran away from Solomon, he's the person that we need to have as our spokesperson to talk to our new king. Again, just this foreshadowing this idea of, of trouble that is to come. And they, they come to Rehoboam and they say, hey, Solomon, he had us work in service, uh, uh, free labor. We don't we don't want to do that anymore. Can you make it a little easier on us? We want, we want to have a lighter yoke, and we think you're the king to do that for us. And he, So Jeroboam goes to Rehoboam, says that to him, and he says, give me some time to think about it. Rehoboam doesn't get a lot of credit. I think that's a good decision. If, if, you, if you need to 
if you need to make a big decision, take time to think about it and seek advice from other people. Good thing Rehoboam did. Um, so verse 6, it says, Then King Rehoboam took counsel with the old men, or the elders, who stood before Solomon, his father, while he was yet alive, saying, How do you advise me to answer this people? And they said to him, If you will be good to his people, to this people, and please them and speak good words to them, then they will be your servants forever. So he goes to the elders, these people who have worked alongside Solomon for 40 years, okay, his entire reign, they worked with him. And he says, hey, I need advice on how to handle this situation. And they give him, they give him what I think is probably good advice. Be kind to them, speak kind words to them. Give them what they want and they will serve you out of respect, not, out of, not because you have a hammer that you're ready to whack them with, but because they respect you, they appreciate the way that you are treating them. We will serve you. And that's the advice that they give him. But verse 7, or, sorry, so they list, so Rehoboam goes, talks to the elders, they say, be kind. So verse 8, he abandoned the counsel that the old men gave him and took counsel with the young men who he had grown up with and stood before him. So he says, that sounds like probably good advice, but that doesn't sound like the most fun thing to do. So I'm going to go talk to my drinking buddies, and we're going to go see what they tell me to do. And I want to be very clear, these, these people that he goes to, they're not necessarily looking out for his best interest. They are here exclusively to tell him what he wants to hear. They, they, don't, they don't care about Israel, they don't care about his well-being, they care about being liked by Rehoboam. And so they tell him whatever it is that's going to make him like them. It makes me think of um, the Beauty and the Beast, that old that Disney movie, okay? So we've got several main characters in Beauty and the Beast. I'm, I think we've all seen it. If we haven't, I'll, I'll give us some context. So you've got Belle, who is the beauty, okay? And then you've got Gaston, okay, who's this big, handsome man. Like, everybody loves him, um, except Belle really doesn't like him because he's super creepy, and he stalks her very uncomfortable. Now Gaston is in love with Belle, so he keeps pursuing her even though she doesn't want it. And then you've got this third character whose name I can't remember. It sounds like Lufa or something like that. Um, but he's this short little fat man who follows Gaston around, okay? And he just tells Gaston whatever he wants to hear, right? There's a whole song that he leads in the movie dedicated to Gaston about how fantastic he is. No one's strong like Gaston, handsome fights like him, whatever. It's just praising Gaston, telling him what he wants to hear to make him feel good about himself. These people that Rehoboam are going to are like that little man. They're just, they're just there to tell him what he wants to hear. Never once does this short little fat man whose name sounds like Lufa ever say, hey, Belle is not interested in you. You should leave him alone, or leave her alone, okay? She's really tired of it. You've been pursuing her for years. She doesn't like it. She, she ran away to a castle. She does not want to be here. Uh, and if you keep going after her, she might file a, restra a restraining order, right? He, he never says that to him. He, he instead says, oh, she's the fool. She's the stupid one for not recognizing how amazing you are. So that's these people to Rehoboam. And let's, let's listen to the advice that they give to him says verse 10, and the young men who had grown up with him said to him, thus shall you speak to the people who said to you, your father made our yoke heavy, but you lighten it for us. Thus shall you say to them, my little finger is thicker than my father's thighs. And now whereas my father laid on you a heavy yoke, I will add to your yoke. My father disciplined you with whips, but I will discipline you with scorpions. So what they tell him to say is, is, you think my dad was bad, I'm worse. If you think he was big, I'm bigger. My pinky finger is thicker than his thigh. If you thought he was hard, I am harder. And he forsakes the advice of the elders, those who know how to run a kingdom, who have done it for 40 years with Solomon, who is considered one of the wisest kings that we have had, who Israel has had. He forsakes the advice of them and, and instead listens to his friends. It says in verse 12, so Jeroboam and all the people came to Rehoboam the third day as the king said, come to me again the third day. 
And the king answered them harshly, and forsaking the counsel of the old men, King Rehoboam spoke to them according to the counsel of the young men, saying, My father made your yoke heavy, but I will add to it. My father disciplined you with whips, but I will discipline you with scorpions. So the king did not listen to the people, for it was a turn of affairs brought about by God that the Lord might fulfill his word, which he spoke to Ahijah, the Shilonite, to Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. So he goes and he says, if you thought my dad was bad, just wait till you get a load of what I'm going to do. And, and, and in verse 15, we see that it talks about this turn of events that was brought about by God to fulfill his word that was spoken to Ahijah. And what this is talking about is when, when Jeroboam fled from Israel, Ahijah followed him, and he took a cloth, and he broke it into 12 pieces, and he handed Jeroboam 10, and he said, here, take these 10 pieces of fabric. This is a reminder to you that one day Israel will be split, and you will rule over 10 of the tribes. 10 of the 12 tribes will be yours. You will not have all of them because the line of David still has to rule, but you will rule over ten. And that is this word, that the word which was spoke by Ahijah the Shilonite. This, this is how this will be fulfilled. And we see this actually take place as we continue reading in verse 16. And it says, And when all Israel saw that the king did and when all of Israel saw that the king did not listen to them, the people answered the king, What portion have we in David? We have no inheritance to the son of Jesse. Each of you to your tents, O Israel. Look now to your own house, David. So all Israel went to their tents. But Rehoboam reigned over the people of Israel who lived in the city of Judah. So Judah is still under the rule of Jeroboam, or of, sorry, of Rehoboam. Got two big names and they sound exactly the same. One's an R and one's a J. My bad. Um, so we've got Jeroboam. Rehoboam, who is now ruling over the, the cities in Judah, and Jeroboam is still acting as a spokesperson leader for uh, the rest of Israel, and they have now been split. Israel says, we don't want you to rule over us. We don't like it, and so we're not going to let you rule over us, and he causes this division. In verse 18, says, then King Rehoboam sent Hadaram who was taskmaster over the forced labor, and the people of Israel stoned him to death with stones. And King Rehoboam quickly mounted his chariot to flee to Jerusalem. And this is kind of, just to really emphasize the wisdom of Rehoboam. So these people, Israel, is upset with him because they don't want to be forced into labor. And so to make peace with him, he sends the taskmaster over forced labor. They're upset because they don't want to be slaves, so he sends the person who decides what work the slaves do. What in the world was he thinking? In verse 19, so Israel has been in rebellion against the house of David to this day. The kingdom is split, and the trouble that was foreshadowed earlier on in this chapter is now made clear. That because of the return of Jeroboam and the lack of wisdom of Rehoboam, Israel has now been divided. And I think that there are several applications that we can take from this. The first, firstly, I think it could be super easy for me to look at this and say, the old people gave good advice. The young people gave bad advice. And so therefore, don't listen to young people, only listen to your elders. I'm sure we, we would love that, but um, that would make this entire sermon kind of pointless because I'm not, I'm not most of your elder. Um, then I'd kind of like the sermon to be significant in some way. And also, that's not what the scripture is teaching. So I'm going to steer clear of those two application points because they're bad. But in actually looking for application, I think that there are two very clear applications. And the first is that we need to be discerning as to where we take our advice from. Ray, Ray Boehm, he does a very good job of seeking advice, right? I, I mentioned that earlier. He took time to d make a decision. He went and sought advice, looked for counsel, and he looked for it in the right people initially. He went to the elders who knew how to make a kingdom run, and he said, what do I do? And they gave him good advice. But yet, he does a very bad job in determining where he should actually take his advice from. 
This results in the division of all of Israel. He goes to the right people, hears the right words, and chooses to ignore it because he wants to do something that he wants to do. It would be like, I'm sure most of us have gone to school, right? And when you go to school, middle school, high school, you get a grade card every quarter, okay? And the order of events for me usually went something like this. Receive report card, take it home, show parents, and then get grounded. Um, and it was fair, because my grades were not always good. But, but imagine a scenario in which me, I'm a, I'm a middle schooler, high schooler in this situation, so I come home, bring home a bad grade card, and my parents say to me, okay, you messed up, you need to fix this. Go talk to your teachers, figure out what you can do to get your grade corrected. I'm like, okay, cool. Go to school the next morning, talk to my teachers. They're like, oh, we can absolutely work this out for you. We've got, we can get you extra credit opportunities. Here's an extra study guide. I've got, here, this person's doing really well. Here's a study partner that you can use. Uh, come in b- at before class and we can talk about what we learned before. We'll go over it, make sure you understand it, right? So my teacher gives me all of these things that I can do in order to, to facilitate my learning to make sure that I do better. And I'm like, yeah, that would work. That would definitely work, but that does not sound like a whole lot of fun. So I go, I leave, and I'm like, I need to get a second opinion, because I didn't like that first one. So I go, and I talk to my friends, and I say, man, my grades aren't great, my parents are unhappy, the teachers want me to do more work to fix it for some reason, what do you, what, what do you guys think that I should do? And they say, play Xbox with us, man, that's way more fun, and I'm like, you know what, that does sound like more fun, I'm going to do that instead. My parents are going to be very unhappy when I bring home my next grade card, and it's, it's worse than the first, right? So this is, this is kind of what Rehoboam is doing. He, he goes, he gets good advice, and he goes and says, I don't like that. I want to do what I want to do. So we need to have discernment in where we take our advice from. And, and the, the second point of application, which, which kind of helps the first, is that in every decision we make, in all advice that we hear, we need to make sure that it aligns with the word of God. In making decisions, we must listen to the Lord. I I, I wonder how close Rehoboam was the day that he was made king to that stone, that, that physical representation of a promise to follow the wisdom and guidance of God. And, and in the midst of this visual reminder that he was to listen to the Lord, he just did not listen. Instead, he did what he wanted to do. God has given us his words. He's given us the Bible. And in everything that we do, every decision we make, all advice that we receive, we can compare it. We can see how it aligns with Scripture. There was a quote, I think it was... I think it was Billy Graham who said this. But he said, any word that you receive that is not found in Scripture is not from God. And any word that you receive that is found in Scripture should be pointless if you're reading the Bible. If, if we are invested in the word, we will know how to navigate life and we will know and be able to discern if the advice that we are receiving is bad. We will, we will know how to manage what we do with ourselves and how we respond to other people and how we take advice and even how we give advice. So as we close, I would, I'll close this in prayer and as the worship team comes up, I would just encourage us to remain steadfast in God's word to, to make sure that we know what it is teaching us that we know how to navigate life. Dear Lord, Thank you for this day. Thank you for the time you've given us to come together to hear your word, to learn your word, God. I pray that as we go throughout the rest of the week, you would allow us to meditate on it, to to hear these truths and to allow it to transform our lives that in everything that we do, we can remain focused on you, God. I pray as we go throughout the rest of our lives, you would allow us to keep our focus on glorifying you through the decisions that we make, through the advice that we receive, through the advice that we give, that you'd allow us to do it for you and for your glory alone. It's in your name I pray, amen.
of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit 
be with us all, now and forevermore. Amen. Hey, church, you are sent.